All right, hi everyone. Welcome to lecture 23. So this lecture is going to be about Taylor series, which are probably another basic concept from calculus that you're probably familiar with to some extent. Um, and what we'd like to do in this lecture is give Taylor series a sort of rigorous treatment and try to understand when we can tell if a Taylor series genuinely converges to the function that it's supposed to represent. Uh, because strangely enough, it turns out that there are many functions which uh, may have, you know, all orders of derivatives at some point. But if you actually take the values of those derivatives and write down the Taylor series, um, the series that you end up with doesn't actually replicate the original function at all, uh, as strange as that is. So um, we'll, we'll see examples of that later. Uh, first, let me just kind of, you know, introduce the, the idea of Taylor series, um, you know, just to set the stage. Uh, so if we um, suppose f of x, well, f is a function <clears throat> defined by a power series. For now, just, just for this uh, you know, little piece of the discussion, we're going to assume that this power series is centered at zero. But everything, the entire discussion that we have could be about power series that are centered at arbitrary points. Um, it's just more notationally convenient to work with power series that are centered at zero. So let's say f is defined by a power series, OK? f of x equals sum of a n x to the n sum of n equals zero to infinity for x in negative r r um, well okay so for x in in you know i uh, some interval whose endpoints open or closed are at plus or minus r, right? And r is greater than zero. So we're assuming that the um, that the radius of convergence of this power series is positive. Okay. Um, then. Um, then we know from previously, right, from 20, 26.5, right, just a few lectures ago, 26.5 tells us that F is differentiable on negative R, R, and that F prime of X is the sum from n equals uh, one, I guess, to infinity, sorry, of, um, oh, actually, let me switch to k, because we're going to use n for the nth derivative later. So, so this is a k x to the k, sum from k equals one to infinity. Uh, now we have k a k x to the k minus one, right? So we know that we can differentiate f and that the, 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 that we can, the formula for the derivative of f is just the term by term derivative of the original power series, okay? Remember, I, I can't emphasize enough that everything we're talking about right now is for a function that is assumed to be defined by a power series, okay? So later on, we're gonna try to translate all of this stuff to situations where a function may come with a different definition and then we try to form a power series representation of it, right? Um, but for now, we're just starting with the power series, okay? So you can take the derivative of the power series on the interior of the interval of convergence, right? Um, so whether or not the original interval included the endpoints, now the new interval, uh, the new domain of the derivative is just, um, is just the open interval from negative r to r. Note that actually like it's possible that this series could converge at negative r or r 
but we don't technically include those points in the domain of the derivative because for the derivative to be defined uh, at a point, we need for the original function to be defined in an open interval around that point. And at negative r and r, you know, at plus or minus r, f is not defined in an open interval containing either of those points, right? Because those are right at the ends of the uh, interval convergence. So negative r and r are never in the domain of the derivative of f, even if they're in the domain, even if the series representing the derivative converges at those points, which is a strange technicality. It doesn't really matter that much, but I mean, it's worth pointing out. So anyway, we can form this power series representing the derivative, right? So then, but then we also know, right? We, we also know that, I mean, well, it's kind of implicit in this sentence that, you know, on negative r, r, this is for x in negative r, r, right? But we did prove a theorem that states that this power series has the same radius of convergence, right? So, and the radius of convergence of AK, of K, AK, X to the K minus one from K equals one to infinity is also R. So, um, the same logic applied to this series, right, representing the derivative shows that f prime is differentiable on negative r r and f double prime of x is now going to be the series from k equals 2 infinity of k times k minus 1 a k x to the k minus 2 right so we just applied we basically just applied the same theorem that we applied 26.5 right so this is the same logic here meaning um, basically just theorem 26.5 Right. So we can just, and then, and then it's like, we can just keep applying 26.5 over and over again because the radius of convergence never changes. So um, we just know, uh, we just know that like, so by, you know, induction basically, Fn, this is how we write the nth derivative. So the nth derivative of f exists on negative r r and um, fn of x the formula would be series from k equals n to infinity of k times k minus one times so on up to k minus n minus one uh, a k x to the k minus n, right? So we have a formula for the power series, for a power series representation for the nth derivative here. Um, and now the, the interesting sort of, uh, you know, observation to make is that if you plug in x equals zero, right? I mean, in general, if you plug in x equals zero into a power series, all that you get is just whatever the first, the constant term of the power series is, right? So f of zero would be a zero, for example, right? So then taking x equals zero in these power series, we find that, um, f of zero is a zero, f prime of zero is a one, right? Um, well, more precisely, let's see, um, f prime of zero would be um, one times a one, you know, yeah. So one times a one, not that it really, makes a difference in the value, of course, but just so you can see the pattern. And then 
f double prime of zero. Well, that would be, let's see, when k equals n, we get n times n minus one, and then all the way down to n minus, or sorry, um, I'm looking at the second derivative. So we would get um, two times two minus one, which is one, right? So two times one times a two is the constant term of the second derivative. So we have two times one times a two. And then the pattern in general is that fn of zero, right? And you can kind of already see it emerging here. Uh, so this is where, you know, if we look at this general formula and we plug in k equals n to get the first term, which is the constant term, right? That's where x, where the exponent here is zero. Uh, so when k equals n, then we get n times n minus one times, you know, n minus two and so on, all the way down to n minus n minus one, which is one, right? And that's n factorial. So we get n factorial and then a n because k equals n. So uh, this is going to be n factorial factorial a n, right? So then, um, so this tells us that, you know, we can, we can calculate the nth derivative in terms of the, the coefficient. So if we know a formula for the coefficients of the power series, right, the original power series for f, um, so, so one way of looking at this, right? So one way of looking at this. if we have a power series representation, represent, representation of, sorry, come on. Representation of a function f and or like, you know, that is to say that we know the coefficients of the power series. Then we can easily calculate fn zero for all n. Another perspective Given f, if f admits any power series representation, then we can calculate a n from fn of zero for all n, right? So if we know the derivatives beforehand and we want to figure out what the power series representation is, we can take those derivatives basically, right? Take the nth derivative and divide it by n factorial. And, uh, and that would give us the power series, that would give us the coefficient, like that relationship has to hold, right? And it sort of goes both ways. So either either pieces, either one of these like, types of data determines the other. Um, the problem, the real like piece, the real like important piece of this here is this assumption of F admits any power series. If F, sorry, hold on. If F admits any power series representation, okay? Because that's the thing that we don't actually know. And that's the thing that's actually hard to figure out, right? I mean, it's easy to, like, I mean, I don't know. For some complicated functions, obviously, it's hard to find a formula or whatever. But in principle, it's like a simpler idea to just calculate these things than it is to actually tell whether the resulting series genuinely represents the original function you started with, right? So the whole point of Taylor series is that we want to sort of be able to go, like, previously, we were interested in just starting with a power series and saying like, okay, what can we say about the function that this power series represents, right? And that's, a, that's an important thing to be able to do, especially because there are functions, there are a lot of functions that are only defined in terms of a power series, right? But there are also a lot of functions that are not defined by power series. And for those functions, it would be nice if we could find power series representation. So the point of Taylor series is, is that it's all about like starting with some function and then being able to like, find a power series representation for that. 
And uh, so this is the first piece of the puzzle here. So this leads us to the definition of the Taylor series in general. So this is definition 31.2, I believe. Yeah. So 31.2 definition. Uh, so given f a function defined on some open interval containing C, then, or well, and let's, and you know, for which Fn, C, the nth derivative, uh, exists for all n. Um, the Taylor series of F at C or about C, I guess, is the word that they use. Is the power series um, I don't know whatever they don't really give it a name but k equals zero to infinity f k c over k factorial x minus c to the k okay so um, Again, the, 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 the logic here is that if we know, if we know that F has a power series representation, then this series is guaranteed to be the correct one. But the point is that, you know, Taylor series exists for any function that has all derivatives at C, right? So here, let me, let me just like highlight this, so. Taylor series exist, or the Taylor series, let's say, the Taylor series of F always exists if Fn of C <coughs> exists for each n, but it may not converge to f of x for any x not equal to c. Okay, I mean, obviously, just by construction, when you put in x equals c, the Taylor series is guaranteed to give you the same value, um, is guaranteed to give you f of c, right? when x equals c, but for any other value of x, it's possible that the Taylor series, the Taylor series may not converge uh, to f of x for any other value of x, even though all the derivatives of f exist, okay? So that's the weird thing about Taylor series. So our goal is to understand, our goal, try to understand when um, the Taylor series of F actually converges to F of X on some open interval around C, okay? Uh, so, yeah, starting with the next video, um, we will begin to explore this question, okay?